So today we're talking about prostate cancer that is spread to the lymph nodes, and we're talking about it in two different scenarios. Whether you have been diagnosed with that situation or you've had treatment and now there are lymph nodes present on a scan. So Dr. Scholz is gonna talk about the ins and outs of both situations and what we need to look for in treating and monitoring that process. So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about metastases in the lymph nodes. So this is, you know, it's two different situations, people who have been newly diagnosed versus people who have had treatment and then it may pop up on a scan later. But can you define and kind of give us some education on what are lymph nodes and where are they in the body relative to the prostate and throughout? So lymph nodes are little pea-sized um, organelles that act kind of like filters for what we call lymph fluid. The blood that flow that you have that's circulating in your bloodstream uh, is red cells and serum. Serum is the water part of the blood. And that serum, or the, the water part, can leak out of the blood vessels into the tissues. So how does the body recapture that? Well, there's a drainage system called lymph. It goes all the way down to your feet and, uh, you know, end of your arms. Fluid then goes into this drainage system, and as it gets pumped back into the bloodstream up here near the heart, uh, there are filters along the way to pick up bacteria and other things so they don't spread into the bloodstream. Those are the lymph nodes, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them all throughout the body. Usually we're talking about the lymph nodes in the region of the prostate, which is historically the most common jumping off spot if one's prostate cancer metastasizes. The first place you look are for the lymph nodes in the pelvis, which are close to the prostate gland. When it comes to prostate cancer, we have, you know, localized disease versus, you know, non-localized disease where it does create these metastases. So we have, you know, different situations where you can have, you know, metastases in a good portion of the lymph nodes surrounding the prostate or just a couple spots. So how do you address that issue? The idea of metastasis uh, is something that jumps usually through the bloodstream, sometimes through the lymph, to a, a completely separate location, such as a lymph node. Just to be clear, spreading outside the edge of the prostate, uh, capsular penetration, uh, spread into the seminal vesicles, which are immediately adjacent to the prostate, that is not metastatic disease. That's just direct extension of the tumor growing to outside the edge of the gland. And it doesn't have the same implications of metastatic disease. For a cancer cell to metastasize, that is get into the bloodstream or the lymph and then land in a different location, put down roots and be able to grow, is a biologically different type of cancer. Uh, one that can just push up against the edge of the prostate or possibly peek out the edge or go into the seminal vesicles has not demonstrated that it has the biologic capacity to metastasize. When we find uh, a metastatic uh, lesion in the pelvis, you can find them with PET scans. Sometimes in the old days, CAT scans, MRIs will see them because they're big. Or if someone has surgery and lymph nodes are removed and they find there's cancer in those lymph nodes, that person has to be recategorized as having a type of cancer. I don't care what the Gleason score was. If, if it's in the lymph nodes, it is a proven metastatic uh, variant of prostate cancer and future and more metastatic lesions quite possibly can show up. The, attitude of saying, oh, prostate cancer is a low-grade process, don't worry about it, all of a sudden has to shift dramatically and say, not in this individual. This individual has a disease with metastatic potential, which could be fatal someday if we don't adopt a very aggressive attitude. So when the disease is in lymph nodes in the pelvis, the usual policy then is to put people on an extended course of hormone treatment for the possibility there may be micrometastatic disease in other locations, and administer radiation treatment to, uh, to a field that covers the majority of the lymph nodes in the pelvic region. Before I get to my next question, please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells YouTube that this video is helpful for you, and they'll push our videos out to other people who are searching for answers when it comes to prostate cancer. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz. Just to give a context, you know, we like to break down Gleason scores and grades when it comes to our videos because we have so many different people watching. Is there a percentage likelihood of metastases based off of Gleason, like your type of prostate cancer and your Gleason grade? Yes. So the things that predict for possible metastases before you check with a scan are your Gleason score. The higher the Gleason score, the more likely the spread. Uh, the higher the PSA, which is a surrogate for how big the tumor is. So as the tumor inside the prostate gets bigger and bigger, 
there's a greater likelihood of metastatic disease. Uh, and you know also the size of the tumor based on how many needle biopsies on a random biopsy show disease or how large it is on an MRI. But Gleason score is much more predictive than the tumor size. The Gleason score is the most important predictor. Unfortunately, even though it's the best predictor, it's not a great predictor. I've had patients who've decided uh, rigidly that they will just simply not treat their Gleason 8 disease, and uh, some of those patients have gotten into big trouble, but others have been watching them for over 10 years and their cancer has never spread. It's not a foregone conclusion that high Gleason scores will always metastasize, not, not by any means. I, we see a good number of newly diagnosed patients who haven't been screened. They'll come in with a PSA of 30 or 40 or 50 and the uh, Gleason score could be 8 or 9 or 10. We get a PET scan and they do not have detectable disease with a PET scan. So I don't want to imply that everyone with a high Gleason score will have metastasis. That's simply not true. But statistically, they're more likely to have metastasis than someone with a Gleason 7. And just to clarify, can the Gleason grade ever be a predictor of where prostate cancer could metastasize throughout the body? No. And that, uh, of course, is the challenge. Uh, well, I think the reason we're addressing this pelvic lymph node uh, met metastatic pattern first is because it's far and away the most common pattern. But prostate cancer is definitely the most genetically diverse type of cancer of all the cancers that humans get. And there are literally thousands of genetic variants of prostate cancer. So they do, there are patterns, and this is what we use to try and predict what the future will be, that prostate cancer can uh, do very unusual things in rare cases. You know, we have two different situations we're talking about here. We have the people who are diagnosed with, you know, spots in their lymph nodes, and we see that there's metastasis, and then we see that people have had treatment, and that's a different situation. Um, so in the first one, how many metastatic, you know, lesions or how many lymph nodes with metastases is it where it becomes more serious versus just, you know, taking out a couple lymph nodes and radiating them? The way that we characterize people that have lymph node spread is definitely impacted by the number of lymph nodes and the location. So far, we've been just covering lymph nodes in the environs of the prostate area down in the pelvis. I think it's a good place to start. It's the most common place that we see initial lymph node metastases. But there's a big difference between someone who has one or two lymph nodes or, say, more than five lymph nodes. And this is clearly delineated in the old-fashioned surgical literature where they would remove lymph nodes surgically. And men that had one uh, lymph node on, uh, you know, so let's say 20 were removed surgically and one had cancer in it, the cure rates with just surgery, no hormones, no radiation, was about 15%. So the um, outlook is certainly better the fewer the lymph nodes. Does that mean that we're less aggressive in people that have, say, one lymph node versus 15 uh, lymph nodes, which would be very extreme, but it could happen? Uh, the um, answer is I don't think it would change our thinking that much. Uh, the thing that could change our thinking is, is if someone was more elderly, you know, if someone's in their mid to late 70s, uh, we say, hey, let's use a little lighter touch in this gen gentleman because you know, if he lives to be 95, we know we can keep him alive that, that long, easily. The number of lymph nodes would be an important consideration in advising people on their prognosis. Uh, someone that has one lymph node and we give them 18 months of hormone therapy, we radiate all the surrounding lymph nodes, uh, I think it's going to have a pretty good cure rate, maybe over 50%. Uh, someone that has 15 lymph nodes, uh, we'll give them the same treatment. That's a very extreme example, 15 lymph nodes, but maybe we should talk to them about a short course, maybe four cycles of, uh, of docetaxel. So is there a standard form of radiation that is used for you know, metastases in the lymph nodes, or are there different types of radiation that patients can seek? Is one more effective than another? It's reasonably standardized. I think it's important, as always, to try and seek out centers of excellence that are good at what they do. There is a difference between high quality and average and low quality radiation, no doubt about that. Some of the other variables, if we stick just to lymph nodes in the pelvic region as opposed to other parts of the body, is whether you could get away with just radiating the field on the same side as where the metastatic lesion is located. Uh, there'd probably be a, some sort of a boost to the known lymph node or known lymph nodes where they, uh, radiation, they can give higher doses to smaller areas. So when you identify the location, they can really burn that lymph node out but then they give a, a more tolerable dose to the field of, of lymph nodes in the same area on the possibility there may be microscopic disease that you would want to eradicate. So those are some of the variables that are considered, but it, 
it's fairly standardized. Radiation therapists give lymph node radiation for other types of tumors, and they're highly trained in how to administer this type of treatment. So when it comes to prostate cancer in the prostate, we have things like Baragel or Spacor to block the, and protect the rectal wall when radiation is happening. But if there are metastases in the lymph nodes, is there any concern that the radiation would hit any other organs or tissue that needs to be protected? There's a major concern for hitting the intestines. And Historically, uh, what we call pelvic lymph node radiation involved just a field that went from your belly button to your pubic bone and they just fired away. But it had a terrible reputation for causing long-term irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea, bleeding, all kinds of things. And the efficacy wasn't that great because they could only give a limited dose. What's changed is that they can now shoot around the intestines. And this is because of the computerized uh, development of intensity modulated radiation and whatnot. So now my concerns about pelvic lymph node radiation are much less than what it would be for someone who has to have radiation to their prostate because the, the unavoidably the urethra can be in the field and long-term side effects can follow up. With modern IMRT, radiation therapists can shoot around the intestines and I don't see uh, toxicity of the intestines uh, with any degree of frequency at the present time. So let me give you kind of a case study really quick. So we, we have a patient who's already been treated and they did have some lymph node invasion. And so they, they had it treated and they you know, kept a pretty stable PSA, but three years out their PSA is about 0.6, it's rising, and then they get a scan and now they have you know, lymph nodes where they're in a different spot. They're above the pelvic region. What do you do in that situation? Well, assuming that they were treated with an aggressive stance, they had pelvic lymph node radiation, and they got maybe 6, 12, or 18 months of hormone treatment. The question will be, you know, is it just one or two spots? And if so, uh, there's pretty much two ways to go. One is to go back to the, the old adage, well, it's one or two spots, but maybe there's others. After all, this has shown up, and we had hoped that the hormone treatment before would eliminate it, uh, and apparently it didn't. It may have postponed the, dis the appearance, but it, now here it is. So one, one scenario would be to say he's had his hormone treatment. Let's just radiate the lymph node and see if the PSA goes back to zero. Keep our fingers crossed that that's the only site of disease. That is, a, a, I think, a plausible way to approach because you can check the PSA every three months, and PSA levels do decline slowly after radiation, but they should steadily decline. And as long as they're on the way down, uh, I, I'm, I'm comforted that we're safe foregoing hormone treatment at that juncture. But the idea that hormone treatment is an efficacious anti-cancer maneuver, maybe the patient only got uh, Lupron the first time and we have second generation hormone treatments, it'd be very reasonable to uh, add six to 12 months of combination hormone treatment on top of the radiation to try and allow for the possibility that there may be other microscopic specs that are gonna show up if we don't do that. So let me give you a different scenario. Let's say that we have a man who had surgery three years ago and he's been monitoring his PSA. It's getting up and now it's about 0.4 and he gets a PSMA scan and he sees an isolated one you know, metastatic lesion in the lymph nodes in his lower abdomen, you know, just right above that pelvic line. So how do you treat a patient? Do they need to go on hormone therapy? What would that look like? A younger man, we're thinking that uh, you know, this person has the misfortune of having a type of prostate cancer that clearly can metastasize, and metastasize a little more widely, not right in the area of the prostate, but uh, into the lower abdomen. This man's gonna get radiation treatment, which should be quite feasible at any skilled facility. The addition of hormone therapy would seem to be very, very uh, necessary, and that is, to prevent uh, other spots from showing up sometime in the future. It's not gonna guarantee nothing will show up in the future, but it will reduce the likelihood that that person will have more spots showing up later. And I think it should be combination hormone therapy with a first and second generation hormonal agent, and it should continue for 12 to 18 months. So when we're talking about metastases and lymph nodes, you know, it, we have the pelvic region and the abdominal region, as you mentioned, but it also go to the chest or to the neck. So can you radi radiate those situations where maybe they have like one or two lymph nodes in the neck or in the chest, and what does that look like? Is it the same type of radiation? Yeah, actually doctors uh, who give radiation uh, they give radiation to the neck all the time for people that have head and neck cancers. They give radiation to the 
chest for people who have lung cancer. So this technology exists. It gets impractical if someone has a string of lymph nodes going from the pelvis through the abdomen, up through the chest and into the neck. You're saying that's such a huge field that uh, practically speaking, it's uh, not likely to be beneficial in that patient. It's just too much radiation. But you can have patients who have isolated spread to a lymph node in the neck or in the uh, chest, and it's uh, certainly plausible to consider radiating that lymph node. And then the consideration, based on many other factors, is whether they should get uh, hormone treatment and or chemotherapy as a uh, ancillary support. We do need to make people aware of the fact that uh, the radiation doctors are more than capable of eliminating these spots, and it's usually done with minimal toxicity. They the doctors who do radiation are highly trained in estimating what the toxicity would and the implications of the treatment are. So they can advise their patients that this type of radiation to this region will be very safe, whereas radiation to this other region of your body will be, you know, if it's close to the esophagus or something like this, would be uh, quite a concern and maybe we should forego it. This is not something they're really guessing at. This is something they're very trained at. And it's uh, nice to know that we have these resources and uh, generally speaking, the radiation therapists are quite knowledgeable as to when it's feasible and when we're really asking too much of the radiation due to the fact maybe it's too widespread. Can you define the differences between lymph nodes metastases versus bone mets? Because a lot of the indications we see for these drugs later in advanced prostate cancer are specific to bone metastases. As a general rule, and again, this is not universal. I've had patients uh, that were diagnosed with large bone Mets in their pelvis 15, 20 years ago, who we radiated those spots. It was very unorthodox, but it was possible and we did it, and who've remained in remission to this day. So that was very unexpected, but they're very memorable because they keep coming back for visits year after year after year. The presence of bone metastasis uh, is generally thought to be a more serious situation than lymph node metastasis, and it's less likely to be cured based on um, you know years and years of experience that was developed prior to the advent of PSMA PET scans. We're finding these bone mets much earlier now, and is it possible that the bad prognosis that was associated with bone mets was based on the fact that our scans were so poor and that we weren't picking this up? I don't know that to be a fact, but we do know that dealing with what we've learned over a history of many years, decades of watching prostate cancer, that in general, the prognosis for bone metastasis, the survival rates, uh, the disease control rates, the complete remission rates is lower in people that have bone metastasis. And so there's a difference between lymph node and bone metastasis in terms of what kind of a prognosis we offer to patients. If you have metastases in the lymph nodes, whether you've been diagnosed with them or you previously had treatment to the prostate and now lymph nodes are present, I just want to encourage you that in 2024, you know, treatments and new technologies are coming out all the time, but also the radiation has gotten better over time and the hormone therapies have gotten better over time. What I would encourage you to do is to talk to your doctor about the side effects and create a side effect mitigation plan because your quality of life matters. If you're going to go on hormone therapy, it's good to know what to expect and what you can do to take care of yourself in the process. If you need help building up, you know, questions for your doctor or learning more about your personal case, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have been through radiation and hormone therapy, and they're trained by our medical oncology team. So they're able to help you learn more and build up your questions so that you have a better outcome when you talk to your doctor. If you would like to donate to PCRI, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Our goal is to get videos like this out to people all over the world. Please remember that you're not alone and I hope you have a great week.